XO Marriage is a nonprofit organization that exists to reach couples worldwide with the message of hope and encouragement that marriage works 100% of the time when you do it God's way. I'm asking you to consider making a special end of the year gift to the outreaches of XO Marriage and also make this ministry part of your monthly giving. When you invest in marriages, you become a part of rebuilding families all around the world. Give now at xomarriage.com forward slash give. I wanna let you know about an exciting new resource. It is called Preparing for I Do. It's an all new pre-marriage video course for engaged couples. Dave and Ashley Willis will walk you through each of the marriage vows and talk about how to prepare not just for your big day, but for the lifelong relationship that you are beginning. The course also includes a discussion guide for deeper conversations and a pre-marriage assessment from me. I developed this assessment to help engaged couples find out if they are on the same page about the most important parts of their marriage. If you're engaged, or if you know someone who is, go to premarriage.com forward slash marriage for 20% off this new video resource. That's premarriage.com forward slash marriage for 20% off. Hi, this is Karen and Jimmy Evans with Marriage Today. This podcast is dedicated to equipping families with the teaching and tools they need to succeed. We hope you enjoy this episode and subscribe for more marriage building content. And today we're going to be talking about how to build a lasting family. This is a really good teaching and it's going to talk about, you know, when you're when you're building a marriage, a family builds around a marriage. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't build a marriage around your children. You build uh, your children around your marriage, and that's how you build a lasting family. And so uh, it uh, this is going to be helpful for people. And we, we have some questions. I'm going to begin by, uh, the teaching is coming up here in just a few minutes. I'm going to begin by reading a question to you from one of our listeners. It says, we have two independent teenagers. How can we effectively guide and support our kids? Their wrong choices are causing stress in our marriage. Well, that's a great question. I think so many families deal with this. I think every family does. Yes. <laughs> And so, I mean, we went through hard times, you know, with the kids, but, um, you know, it wasn't anything not fixable, you know, and I I know as a mother, I always said, if you don't pray, you will when you have kids, because you're always on your knees, <laughs> you know, praying for your children. And um, I think one of the hardest things is if you don't have good communication. And, you know, so, you know, build those skills into your kids and with yourself and them where you're a good listener as well as a good, you know, person. Yeah, it's who, relational. Yeah, mm-hmm. and where they know that they can trust you, and but yet you have guidelines. I know our daughter was strong-willed, and one of the things she said after she'd gotten um, out of the house and in college that one of the things that she needed from us was us to keep her— uh, in discipline because she had a tendency. She respected us more when we had guidelines for Well, her. and children need rules. Mm-hmm, they do. It makes them feel secure. Not legalism, Mm-mm. but they need rules. Now, the thing that troubles me about the question is where it says we have two very independent teenagers. Teenagers shouldn't be independent. No. They, they should be under the authority of their parents. Mm-hmm. And you love them and you give them, you, you know, increasingly— as, as children earn it, mm-hmm. you give them more freedom. Mm-hmm. But if they don't earn it, they don't have it. You, when you always told our kids, as long as I'm paying the bills, you will abide by our, our rules you at bet. home. You bet. I told them, fine, if, if you want to do that, pay for your own bills. <laughs> and But but to say you have independent teenagers, and see, children will wear you mm-hmm. out. Uh, and so they're, they're making poor choices, and it's putting stress on our marriage. Well, all children make poor choices. And, but you have to relationally manage it. But the, also, you have to be a united front. You have to be a team. And don't. And this is what we did right, Karen. When our kids were teenagers, we prayed, we talked, and we presented a united front to our mm-hmm. kids. We didn't let them divide us. We also didn't let them exhaust us. Mm-hmm. We had time together that was inviolable. Because, see, with these two teenagers, in one of our previous podcasts, we had a question from a woman, and she was basically saying, our kids left, and now we don't have a marriage. Well, that's what happens. Mm-hmm. If you let your children exhaust your— every, every every couple has challenges with their kids that affects your marriage. But pray about it. Mm-hmm. Talk about it. Go get help if you need to go get help. Mm-hmm. But don't let it exhaust you. Don't let it divide you. I agree. Okay, this question is, what can you do to make God real to your children on a daily basis? Uh, live it in front of them. Mm-hmm. Someone asked me one time if we did, like, daily devotionals with our kids. Uh, no, that's the answer. We had an all-day devotional Mm -hmm. that every time our kids went through, first of all, we wanted our children to become like us. We had a genuine faith in Christ. We didn't want religious kids. Mm -hmm. We didn't want legalistic kids. We wanted kids that loved the Lord. 
And so we loved the Lord. We woke up in the mornings and prayed. Uh, we loved each other. We prayed together. Uh, we, went, we went to church. We took them to church. And so uh, here's what kids resent. They resent parents who shove God down their throats, mm -hmm. who are too strict, non-relational, religious kind of. I, I, had, I had friends that I grew up with that became drug addicts and alcoholics, and every one of them, the, the, my close friends had religious parents mm -hmm. that tried to force God down their throats and they rejected it. Mm -hmm. Well, the other bad thing is just to leave leave it up to your kids, you know, and, and, and just say, well, if you want to pursue God, pursue God. You have to lead your children to the Lord, but the best way you lead is by example. Mm -hmm. And if I if I have a relationship with the Lord that is a, a good, and, and the fruit of God comes out, you know, I'm a more loving person because I'm close to God. I'm a more patient person because of God. If my children respect me, and I have a relationship with them, that's the best way to get them to go to God. Mm -hmm. as, as a preacher, uh, there's a guy that I know right now who's doing a dissertation on preacher's kids. And uh, whether preacher's kids are good or bad, I can just tell you, if, if a preacher th puts his children on the altar of his success and the church becomes first, mm -hmm. they will hate God and hate mm -hmm. that church. Well, I think, too, as parents, you know, the— it's so easy to get caught up in what other people think and yeah. a fear of what other people are going to think of our family if our kids are not perfect. And, you know, it comes back to the relational issue. You know, my relationship with God wasn't perfect, but I wanted it to be good. And so it's the same principle of, you know, I don't want to make what other people think the the core foundation of my life. I want to be what God thinks. God. And I want that to have that awe and respect of God in our home where they feel comfortable being relational with God, where they feel like the relationship that you and I have with God is real. It's not just so that people will think we're uh, good people. Yeah. It's because it's a genuine relationship. Well, our kids both have the same relationship with God today mm -hmm. that we have. Mm -hmm. And their children, they're raising their children the way we raise them. And that, that makes you feel successful. It also gives you hope There'll be another generation of Evanses mm -hmm. uh, in Albrocks that love the Lord, that have good marriages mm -hmm. and good families, and that's very hopeful. Well, we hope that you enjoyed this today. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already uh, and leave a review. We love hearing from you. Now we're going to go to the teaching on how to build a lasting family. Romance is one of the most misunderstood aspects of the marriage relationship, but it's absolutely critical. For a marriage to be vibrant and dynamic, you must have romance present in the relationship every day. As a Marriage Today podcast listener, we want to give you a free ebook that is an excerpt from my new book, The Four Laws of Love. The free ebook is called The Four Elements of Romance, and you can get it now by texting Marriage Today, one word, to 31996. Get the free ebook now by texting Marriage Today to 31996. And now time for an ad about ads. I want to talk to you about Gumball. Gumball is the platform that we use to book this ad that you're listening to right now. And Gumball is looking to make the podcast advertising process a whole lot simpler, not just for us, but for everyone. Typically, these ads make it to your ears through a very complicated back and forth process. Advertisers reach out to networks and networks look through their available shows to find good fits. There's a whole lot of emails and it's messy, like more messy than it should be. That's where Gumball comes in. It's a self-serve marketplace for advertisers to buy podcast ads directly from podcasters and it's majorly streamlining things. With Gumball, advertisers can search for shows like ours and easily purchase campaigns online with a few clicks. Marriage Today just joined Gumball. So guess what? You can buy ads on our show through Gumball. You can find us by going to gumball.fm and search for Marriage Today. If you're an advertiser or a podcaster, have a look at gumball.fm. Browse shows, discover new advertising options, or listen to your own podcast today. You don't want to build a family that your children reject or have to recover from. I shouldn't have had to spend my 30s, I mean my 20s getting over my childhood. And neither should Karen. And I blessed my parents. They were better people than they should have been. My 20s should have been a time for me to be able to, to grow and learn and become. And when you raise children properly, they don't have to get over you. When you raise children properly, you give them the advantage 
that maybe you didn't have. And for some of you in this series, for some of you, you're like Karen and me. You will be the first generation in your family to have a godly family. We are the first generation. There was not a generation before us. And I wish I could sit here. Sometimes I'll, I'll listen to someone and they'll say, yeah, I'm a five generation preacher. And when I hear someone say, I'm a four or, five, four or, fifth, four or fifth generation Christian, I love that. That's the way it ought to be. But for some of us, that's not what we had. And in this series, what I want to do is to teach you how to build a godly family, to build a family that lasts, a loving, honest, safe, godly family. Now, this is a scripture, Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended. The floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. And so this is a promise now that Jesus is making, and just a very simple promise. Jesus says, if you will listen to my words and obey them, you're like a wise person building a house on the rock, a sure foundation. But if you hear my words and reject them, you're like a foolish person building your house on the, sand, on the sand. There are three promises in this little text that we just read here. Number one promise is Jesus promises serious difficulties in all of our lives. See, the thing that the rock people and the sand people have in common is rain, floods, and wind. He, he promises it to everybody. And so understand, in this life, the reason that you need a sure foundation is because there's gonna be difficulty. Well, let me ask this question. Why would anybody be foolish enough to build a house without a foundation? I mean, if you were driving down the street and you saw someone building a fabulous house, without a foundation, I mean, you would understand how foolish that was. Because in, to build a house without a foundation, you have to utterly reject reality. There might be rain. There's gonna be a whole lot of rain in there. A lot of rain, tornadoes, you know, hail, whatever there is. When you see a person building a house without a foundation, you're thinking that's an extremely presumptuous, arrogant person who's divorced himself from reality. Well, why would a person build a life not on the Word of God? Because they've utterly rejected spiritual reality. So what reality are you talking about, Pastor Jimmy? An evil devil is going to try to destroy your life. Take that to the bank. He hates your guts. Jesus said the enemy only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he said in John 10. He's going to come to your life to steal, kill, and destroy. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, he said the devil is like a prowling uh, lion going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Jesus used the word destroy, and Peter used the word devour. The devil wants to destroy and devour you, and he will attack your marriage. He will attack your children. He will attack your family. He will attack your health. He will attack your finances. He will attack your reputation. He'll attack everything precious in your life. And if you don't believe that, you're not living in reality. He's coming for you. He's coming for you. He's attacked our marriage, he's attacked our children, he's attacked our family, he's attacked our health, he's attacked everything that we have and he'll keep attacking it. And the only reason I'm standing here right now is I have stood on the word of God. My life has been built on the word of God. It's a promise, we're not special, we're not smarter. It's just a promise for anyone who hears the word of God and obeys it. Jesus promises, this is the second promise by the way. The second promise is success. Jesus promises success and security and success to those who obey his word. He said, it's gonna work. Even though the rains come and the floods come and the winds blow, your house will stand because it's built on a sure foundation. Matthew 7, this analogy, Jesus re refers to his word as being a sure foundation in the storm. Ephesians 6 tells us that the word of God is the sword of the spirit that slays the enemy. Psalm 119 tells us that the word of God is the light in the darkness that shows the way. And let me say, when you're building your life on the word, you're invincible. The devil can't beat you. 
The, the devil, when you're living your life on the word, you do not need to be afraid of the devil. He needs to be afraid of you. You're building on a sure foundation. You've got the sword of the spirit. You're walking in the light. And the Bible goes on and on to say the importance of the word of God. But listen, it's in the devil's best interest that you don't believe what I'm saying. He's counting on you not believing what I'm saying. He's coming for you. He's coming for you. And he wants to destroy everything precious in your life and he wants to wreck every dream that you have and turn it into a nightmare. He only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he may devour people who aren't living their lives on the word. He may devour them. Permission granted. And Jesus also promises, this is the third promise, Jesus promises failure to every person and family that disobeys his word. Jesus said, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell, listen, and great was its fall. And great was its fall. Devastation, family devastation. In my, you know, as I've lived my life and, and lived my life in ministry, I can't tell you how many stories of devastation that I hear every week, every week. There's not a week that goes by that I don't, I don't hear about another family and the devastation of another family and, and always they're playing games. Always they're either living in sin or they're playing games with God. And when you, when you find a, a, a family that is on their way to devastation, they'll always say something like this, I believe the Bible, but. So Jesus said, they heard my words, they just wouldn't do them. And people who are on their way to destruction, many of them believe the Bible. I mean, they, they just don't want to do it because it's too hard. I believe the Bible, but you don't know my situation. I, don't, I believe the Bible, but I just can't forgive them. I, I believe the Bible, but I was born this way. You shouldn't say I believe the Bible, but you should say I believe the Bible and. Amen. I believe the Bible, and because of that, I'm going to forsake my sinful lifestyle. I believe the Bible, and because of that, I'm going to repent of my sins, and I'm going to get rid of the friends that are trying to lead me into more sin. Whatever the Bible says, I'm not going to find an excuse for it. I'm going to find a reason to do the right thing. Jesus promises failure. And the question then is, why would anybody build on sand then? And it's really kind of a simple answer. First of all, sand is more comfortable. You know, I mean, it just is. I love, Karen and I love going to the beach because it's just so comfortable. It's easy. Listen, it's easy living in sin until the devastation hits. I, let me say personally, I love sin. I do, except for that death thing. The wages of sin is death. I personally love sin. It's just that death thing I don't like. Oh, it's very comfortable. Very comfortable. The other thing that's more popular, when you go to the beach, people aren't laying up on the rocks. They're down on the sand. In the world today, people are on the sand, and they're persecuting the people on the rocks. So if you want to be popular in our world, you're not going to be a biblical Christian. You're going to find a more popular spot. And it's conformable. Sand is conformable. When you lay down on sand and get up, it looks like you. When you lay down on rock and get up, you look like it. <laughs> right? See, Jesus isn't going to conform to anything we want him to be like. He's not your little plastic Jesus that you massage around to be whatever you want and dress him in your own clothes. Jesus is Jesus, and he ain't changing for nobody. And we can accept him for who he is or reject him, but Jesus is Jesus. And in our world today, we have a custom-made Christianity. Take what you want, leave what you want, believe what, in the Bible what you want, don't believe what you want, and I'm a Christian in spite of my sinful lifestyle. And I'm telling you right now, that's not what Jesus is into. He doesn't conform to me, I conform to him. But that's what people love about the sand. Custom-made Christianity, custom-made religion, anything that I want, when I want, it's comfortable, it's popular, and it's conformable. Not the rock. The rock is certainly not easy. Sometimes it's very difficult. It's certainly not popular, especially in the world that we live in, and it doesn't conform to me. I have to conform to it. But let me say something. When difficulty hits, it is the most peaceful place on earth. And when you're building your family, you don't lose one toothpick in the storm. Your family isn't hurt, your marriage lasts, your children survive, 
your finances succeed. Everything in your life is blessed upon that rock. And sometimes it's harder, and sometimes you lose friends over it. But let me just tell you something. In the long run, it's the only place to build your life. So I'm going to tell you how to build your family to last real quickly. Number one, surrender your life and your family to the Lordship of Jesus. Jesus is Lord. And I want to to make a statement here. This is kind of a shocking statement, really. Listen to what I'm saying. In a godly family, there's not a dominant person. If, If there's a dominant person in your family, it is not a good family. Now, when I do, I do a a poll all over the world. I've done this poll in hundreds of thousands of people, live audience. And it typically is like in a marriage seminar. And I don't want you to answer this. And I don't do this in church because if everybody's related and I don't want you embarrassed. But here's the question that I ask. Um, don't, Don't answer this. How many of you were raised in a family where one of your parents was clearly dominant over the other parent? Now, when I ask that question, 70% of hands immediately go up. Not a second delay. Like it, okay. And I'm gonna raise my hand because I was. Okay. And then I asked this question. How many of you believe that was negative in your family? 70% of hands immediately go back up. Let me say this. If you're a dominant person and you're dominating your family and the main thing in your family is for you to get your way, you have taken Jesus' place in your family. Your, your family is not submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I was a dominant husband. I was a dominant man until I repented and became a godly husband. Let me say this. Karen and I never talk about who the boss in our family is because our boss of our family is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, we make every decision together. We make every decision together. We don't dominate each other. We don't browbeat each other. We don't make each other pay a price for saying how we feel. We talk and we pray until we make a decision. Every decision is made under the Lordship of Jesus Christ with us being equals. But if Karen dominated me, or if I dominated Karen, Jesus isn't the Lord. You have a dominant person trying to run the family. You submit, surrender your family to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and together seek his will until you hear him. Number two way to build a family that lasts, be willing to do the hard and unpopular things that God tells you to do. That's why you know you're building on the rock. Some things are hard. Some things aren't easy. See, people people that build their lives on the sand, most of them believe the Bible. They just don't do it because it's hard. And you say, you know, you ought to forgive that person that abused you growing up. Well, I can't. It's just too hard. Well, part of being a Christian is doing things that are hard that other people don't do. Let me tell you something. You talk about hard forgiveness. You don't think it was hard for Jesus to look down from the cross and to forgive the people who put him there? And no one has done to us anything close to what they did to Jesus. If Jesus could forgive the people that crucified him, we can forgive everybody that we need to forgive. You treat your wife right. Well, it's just too hard, Pastor Jimmy. Living with you probably isn't easy, you know. Some some lady just said amen. You know, I heard a big amen from somebody out there. Love your husband in spite of his faults. Tithe, pray, put your finances on the foundation of God's word. Stand for God when people are criticizing you and rejecting you because of your faith in Jesus. Don't cave in the midst of this ungodly generation. You stand for Jesus and you stand upon his word. You say, well, Pastor Jimmy, that's hard. That's right, it is hard. When you have a rock underneath you, sometimes it's hard. But whenever bad times come, you need to thank God something hard's underneath you. A godly life is built doing the hard thing and the right thing. And that's where an easy life comes from. Peace comes from successful warfare and building your life, being diligent in building your life. And when everybody else's life is falling apart, yours is peaceful. When everybody else is losing, You're gaining. You build your life on the word of God and sometimes it means doing the hard thing, staying in a marriage when you don't want to stay. Doing the right thing when you don't feel like doing the right thing. Number three, think about the generational effects of your behavior and plan accordingly. We're talking about building a family that lasts. Think about the generational effects of your behavior and plan accordingly. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. I heard, I hear stories about my my family. Um, 
when, you know, my, my descendants and my family. And sometimes when I hear those stories, I, I think this to myself. What were they thinking about? D didn't they understand the devastation that that was going to send for generations? Because part of what I was raised in wasn't just my parents' issues, it was generational issues that my parents also inherited. Let me, say, let me ask you a question. Are your children going to have to recover from you? Are your children going to get blessed by you? A good man, a righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Everything I do is affecting my great-grandchildren. Everything I do. The Bible says that God visits the iniquities of the fathers to the children, to the third and fourth generations. Every, everything I do, right or wrong, is affecting generations in my family. Let me ask you another question. What are future generations going to say about you? Are they going to be in therapy? Tr forgiving you? Are they going to refer to you as the person who devastated the family? Or are they going to be sitting there one day saying, you know something, this blessing came from my grandfather, my grandmother. This blessing came from my mother and my father. They loved me. They raised us right. They sacrificed for us. Will you be a godly person? Will you be a person that generationally blesses your children and grandchildren? If you do, you'll have to plan on that. You will have to make a decision that says, my grandchildren are gonna talk well of me. My children are gonna talk well of me. I'm not gonna give them everything they want. I'm not gonna spoil them that way. But I'm gonna love them, and I'm gonna be a godly example to them. And this is the last thing. Keep your family in committed fellowship and a Bible preaching and believing church where they can be grounded spiritually, held accountable, and build strong relationships. One of the most important things that Karen and I did when we were young is we said we're gonna raise our kids in church. You will be like your friends. You are, your children are gonna be like their friends. And we need to have a group of people that we're with on a regular, committed basis that we can encourage each other, that we can hold each other accountable, and that we can just hold each other's arms up, especially if we're in the midst of a battle. I'm saying, don't build a one-generational family that your kids reject and have to recover from. And some of you have lived in that life, and you know what I'm talking about. Build a family that lasts for generations. And generations from now, the, the blessing of your life, the blessing of your love and your sacrifice is still blessing them. And I said this earlier, let me say it one more time. Karen and I are first generation. When you go back before us, you can't find people living for God. And some of you have come out of utter devastation from the family that you came out of. Would you be the first generation to change that? Would you be the person in the midst of your hurt, in the midst of your issues that you've brought from your family, would you be the person that stands up and says, God, heal me, and I will be a righteous parent, a righteous family member? to build a family that lasts. Hey, this is Brent Evans with Exo Marriage, and I wanna thank you for listening to the Marriage Today podcast. We believe your marriage has a 100% chance of success if you do it God's way. If you enjoyed today's teaching and want to keep learning, hey, subscribe to the Marriage Today podcast and take some time to leave us a review. Your reviews help us spread the word and can encourage someone else in need. For more great marriage content, check out exomarriage.com where you can see all of our marriage building resources, articles, and live events. Mark and Grace Driscoll are two of my favorite people and they have a fantastic marriage. They're very close friends of mine. I've known them for years. And Mark and Grace have a new podcast on the XO Podcast Network. It's called Real Marriage with Mark and Grace Driscoll. They bring deep content to life in a practical way that will help you in your marriage. Search for The Real Marriage Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts or go to exopodcasts.com.